Final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 14164 in the name of Patricia Ferguson on GP practices at the deep end healthy life expectancy. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Patricia Ferguson to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Ms Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I begin by also thanking those colleagues from across the Chamber who signed my motion and made this debate possible. General practitioners at the deep end are those who work in the 100 most deprived populations in Scotland based on the proportion of their patients with postcodes in the most deprived 15% of Scottish data zones. And I'll apologise now, presiding officer, that my speech has an awful lot of statistics within it, but I think it does help to emphasise the, the case that I want to make. And those statistics show that people living in such areas are likely to attend their GP more often and will need longer appointment times because they are likely to present with more than one health issue at a time. This in turn means that GPs with even a small or average size patient list are likely to have a greater workload than their colleagues in more affluent areas simply by dint of their geographical locations and the health issues their patients have. To understand the situation, it is helpful to compare those statistics again. Across Scotland, the average prevalence per 100 patients of congestive obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is 2.21. That's 2.21 patients in every 100. In the Balmore practice in Postal Park in my constituency, this jumps to 4.18 in every 100. But at the other end of the scale, in a relatively affluent area like Hindland in Glasgow, the figure is only 0.63. So it's 0.63 in Hindland, presiding officer. It's 2.21 on average across Scotland. And in a particular practice in my constituency, it's 4.18. And the same level of statistics for smoking-related ill health show that 24.87 people per 100 is the average figure for Scotland, while Balmore has 29.17 and Hindland has just 13.6. So it's no wonder that GPs in practices like Balmore are frustrated and angry about their predicament and that of their patients. It's widely recognised, presiding officer, and has been for a very long time, that men and women in the most deprived fifth of the population will die 10.4 and 6.9 years respectively earlier than those in the least deprived fifth. But the fact that disturbed me most and one that was new to me, I have to confess, when I read it first and which has been the catalyst for my motion and for this debate, is the difference in healthy life expectancy or the estimate of how many years people are expected to live in a healthy state. If we look again at the most deprived fifth and the least deprived fifth of the population, the two ends of the extreme, the figures could not be more stark. The healthy life expectancy of men and women in the most deprived fifth ends 20.8 and 20.4 years earlier than those in the least deprived. Now, that's potentially 20 years of productivity lost for individuals and their families. It's 20 years, possibly, of pain or discomfort. And it's potentially 20 more years of stress and anxiety. Now, that isn't right, and it cannot be acceptable. Practices like Balmore provide their patients with an excellent service. And the team of doctors, nurses and the pharmacists work together to ensure that they continue to do so but they are struggling to do everything they want to do and everything they are expected to do within their existing resources. In summary, we have a situation where GPs at the deep end are dealing with patients with higher levels of multimorbidity at a younger age. And those patients need longer appointments and more follow-up and support. But the average spend per annum in these practices is £118 per patient per year compared to the Scottish average of 123 and £127 per patient per annum 
in the most affluent fifth. So if these GP practices have no additional funding to recognise the difficulties and the problems they and their patients face, it stands to reason that the staff in these practices are working longer hours in more challenging circumstances and that this will eventually affect recruitment and retention. There is even a name presiding officer for this phenomena. It is the inverse care law and it states that, and I quote, the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. In their submission to the consultation on Affairs Scotland, the GPs at the deep end stated that this is, and I quote again, not a law of nature, however, but a long-lasting, long-standing man-made policy which restricts access to care based on need. Presiding officer, it is surely time to end this situation and to recognise that we have a particular set of circumstances that puts huge demand on the deep end practices and everyone who works in them. And we surely have to find a way of funding GPs that doesn't adopt the one-size-fits-all approach. We have already witnessed GP practices without these problems and issues, experiencing problems with recruitment and retention of staff right across the country. And it's sheer dedication and commitment that is keeping many of our GPs in post at the moment. Now, the First Minister's announcement yesterday of additional funding for GP training is very good news. But how long will it take to filter through the system and to make a difference? We need more action now to avert the escalation of this crisis. In July of this year, the Balmore Practice sent an 11-page open letter to the Health Board, and I'm sure the Minister has had an opportunity to see that for himself. In that, they detailed the problems they face, and they also made some suggestions as to solutions. Fortunately, the Health Board has now decided that it will give them some additional support and help, and that again is welcome. But it isn't a long-term solution, and it seems to me that it's long-term solutions these practices need. In closing, presiding officer, I can do no better than to quote again from the submission that the Deep End Practices made to the Scottish Government's consultation on Affairs Scotland, a document that actually didn't talk about their particular predicament in any case. But they said, and I quote, equitable access to emergency care has been a shining example of the NHS commitment to comprehensive health care based on need and free at the point of use. A similar commitment is needed to reduce inequitable access to non-emergency care, especially general practice, and also to reduce social variations in access to specialised and centralised services. Surely that's a sentiment that we can applaud, presiding officer, and one that our policy and our funding should support. Thank Many thanks. <coughs> And now, moving swiftly on, Colin Bob Doris to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Tight for time today, four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the debate this afternoon as an opportunity to draw attention to the significant pressures being experienced by Balmore Practice and, and Postle Park, and we've heard some of that already. I've not signed the motion itself because I don't accept part of the proposition made in the motion that in relation to deprivation levels, that funding distribution arrangements take no account of the additional burden that this places on staff and resources. I do, however, welcome uh, the debate around whether sufficient uh, account is taken of deprivation levels. And I commend Patricia Ferguson for putting many of the statistics on the record here this afternoon, which need further interrogation. And I do want to focus in relation to Balmore Practice. Balmore Practice in Postle Park has made a powerful case to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde for additional resources in relation to the processors that practice is under. I too, following a meeting with the GPs there, have corresponded with the Health Board to make the case for additional resource. I have also drawn the matter to the attention of the Scottish Government, and I welcome that the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing has agreed to meet with me to discuss some of these concerns. I welcome the additional locum cover that is being provided to Balmore Practice by the NHS. That cover amounts to three half-day sessions by a locum GP for a 12-week period. The additional support will, and I quote from correspondence I have received from the NHS, fully explore the issues raised by the practice and together take steps to ensure the continued viability of the practice. 
In fully exploring those issues, I would urge the NHS to properly consider the high level of patients with complex health needs and significant multimorbidities, as well as the profound health inequalities that exist. It is also worth highlighting the many asylum seekers that have enriched Postal Park, but who often also have complex health needs themselves. Let me highlight two additional matters before looking at a positive and constructive way forward. Firstly, the locum GP support is welcome, but for understandable reasons of continuity of care, often locum GPs do not see the most clinically challenging and complex patients when they are providing cover. These patients would see their regular GP. We must ensure that any exploration of demands placed in Balmore practice takes account of the day-to-day -day reality of resident GPs that are there. Um, Briefly, yeah. I'm sure um, I echo the point Mr Doris is making about continuity of care and I'm sure he will agree with me that the fact that another GP has now resigned from that practice makes that situation all the more critical. Doris. I, I thank Professor Verdon for making that point. Uh, if a time constraints won't allow me to develop that particular point further, but that's a point well made. Uh, secondly, an additional G uh, secondly, the additional locum GP support will end just before Christmas, presiding officer. In other words, it will be thrown just as the peak winter pressures are about to be placed in Balmore surgery. I would hope that Greater Glasgow and Clyde continue with additional locum cover support into the new year, whilst analysing the findings of the review of Balmore practice. I make these points to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. I would like the Scottish Government to perhaps consider making similar representations to the Health Board. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has recently announced an additional £60 million for the Primary Care Development Fund as to ensure the quality of care in general practice. This has been delivered following discussions with the BMA and the Royal College of General Practitioners. Given that some of that cash will seek to support, develop and test new ways of working in order to improve services, I would ask that consideration is given to working with Balmore Practice to fund any new ways of working and a pilot could be taking place within Postle Park. The practice is already developing new models of working, including greater role for pharmacists. The Assistance Advice Bureau are also present there, and addiction workers, as well as uh, a range of community nurses. I believe that working with Balmore Practice, including there is, a, there is sufficient locum cover to allow the resident GP partners to develop these new services and these new pilots, is essential and would be a good use of government and health board money for the new ways of working that we all want to see. Can I finish off by thanking the practice manager, Susan Finlay, for taking the time to speak to me this morning. Susan, along with Drs Alison Reid and Lindsay Crawford, as GPs at Balmore Practice, have to deal with the day-to-day -day realities yes, of working at the coal face of a wonderful community, but one with huge challenges. I am delighted to take part in this debate because I think together and constructively we can build a better way of delivering the health service for the constituents that we all want to represent to the best of our abilities. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Now call on um, gosh, uh, Dr Richard Simpson to be followed by Dr Nanette Milne. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to congratulate Patricia Ferguson on obtaining this important debate. And as I always do, Minister, I want to begin by giving credit to the Government for providing the funding to the Deep End Group in order that they can meet. This type of getting together by doctors from the 15 per cent most deprived practices in Scotland has in itself been beneficial in reducing the isolation that is often felt by general practitioners. Recognition that they should have, prob that they had, they have problems that they share is actually a good starting point. And it is very clear from the extensive publications from this group that their view has a wide resonance, not only in Scotland but across the United Kingdom. But, Minister, the unpalatable fact is that the inverse care law to which Patricia Ferguson referred, which was propounded half a century ago, or almost half a century ago, in Wales by Dr Tudor Hart, is alive and well in Scotland's general practice. The inverse care law, in essence, is the provision of resources is in inverse proportion to the levels of need. And as Patricia Ferguson has illustrated, the level of need is beyond question, with significantly higher levels of physical and mental ill health, a shorter life expectancy, and as important, as she indicated, the, the period during which people have to put up with ill health is very much longer in this group. In the very first session of Parliament, the Health Committee interrogated what was then known as the Arbuthnot Committee about the basis for allocation of NHS resources. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to ask the Minister in his response to indicate whether the successor committee, known as the National Resource Allocation Committee, has now taken into account not just population, not just the elderly, not just deprivation, but the actual need, which can to now to be largely determined by the far better recording of epidemiological data, something the Arbuthnot Committee could not achieve. In my view, it is long overdue for health boards to be instructed to ensure that resource allocation to primary care is based on need. It is clear that the poorest decile have double the mental illness, much greater numbers of physical illness, and a feature of the poorer areas is, the, is that greater prevalence of mental illness. Twice the number of face-to-face -face consultations for mental illness, three times the prescribing of antidepressants. The fact that there are more resources allocated to practices with much lower levels of deprivation is utterly appalling. The challenge of multiple morbidity and social complexity, shortage of time for the GPs and their staff, reduced expectations which result from that, lower enablement, poor health literacy, increasing practice stress, and very weak interfaces with the rest of the services uh, are all collectively in the deep end publications. The only move the government have so far taken, as far as I know, and the minister can correct me, is to fund the recruitment of a small number of liaison workers. Now, this is no doubt helpful because it has been de de uh, demonstrated recently by Deep End sponsored research that the significant needs for benefits advice, for example, to ensure that there is maximum amount to uptake is vital. That study was actually done in Postle Park, but not in the Balmore practice. Minister, every practice in the Deep End group should be supported by someone helping with benefits advice and the maximization, because this is about social medicine as well as uh, uh, physical and mental health. The GPs and need to have an understanding of the current conf conflict, conflicted, fragmented benefit system, and will need to understand the new systems that will come in with the transfer of powers it proposed in the Scotland Act. Scotland has hitherto been blessed with an equality of GP provision in that every area has had GP available, but this is no longer the case. We are now facing a crisis which the government is beginning to appreciate. And if we see more practices like the Balmore one with GPs resigning, methyl in my practice, in my constituency area, just closing, the, then we're going to have real problems. The announcement of 100 more GP trainee places is welcome, but there's a 20% vacancy rate in the current trainee places, and most of those are in the west of Scotland. So that's really not going to help. Uh, presiding officer, I'll close with the fact that, they, that, that we did an FOI very recently, and what we asked the health boards were, was, have you undertaken and do you have a risk register in relation to the risks being faced by your general practices? Close, Minister, please. only three said yes. Only three. If the health boards don't assess the risk register of their GPs, then we are as in much trouble as the government's previous denial of the problems in general practice. Thanks. Um, and before I invite Nanette Milne to speak, uh, due to the number of speakers wishing to speak in this debate, I am minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Ms Ferguson, would you please move such a motion? I would move that motion, President thank, Officer. Thank you very much. So the question is, do we agree that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes? We do. Many thanks. Now call Dr Nanette Milne to be followed by Jim Hume. Uh, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I realise that this is a very serious issue in Patricia Ferguson's constituency, but it also gives us the opportunity this evening to look at the wider problems associated with GP practices and patients in deprived areas. I therefore congratulate Patricia Ferguson on bringing forward this debate. I think all of us would agree that general practice in Scotland faces challenges ahead with factors such as the growing shortfall of GPs to look after an increasingly elderly population with complex comorbidities. Added to this, of course, is the number of GPs set to retire in the next five years without being able to attract their replacements, and many who are qualified moving abroad to practice. So we start with a situation whereby, if not a crisis, there is a serious problem with overworked GPs and understaffed practices. It's clear that this is magnified in areas where there's manifest deprivation. And as Patricia Ferguson has said, in places such as Postle Park and other parts of Glasgow. Glasgow University's research into general practitioners at Deep End throws up some very concerning facts and figures regarding life expectancy and the broad health and well-being of people in the most deprived areas of our society. 
The fact that men live over 10 years less and women nearly seven years less than the Scottish average in the most deprived fifth of the population is something which needs to be addressed. So too, as already stated, is the case that in the most deprived fifth of the population, men and women spend twice as long in poor health before they die, with 23 years compared to nearly 13 years for men and nearly 26 years compared to 12 years for women. Clearly, these statistics have a huge knock-on effect on GP services, where poor health obviously leads to greater demands on local surgeries. However, the real problem lies with the difference between demand and unmet need. In giving evidence to the Health and Sport Committee regarding health inequalities, Professor Graham Watch from GPs at the Deep End told us that the challenge lies in defining the extent of unmet need within the primary care system. In deprived areas, there are people with conditions, often of a specialist nature, which are not dealt with, either through individuals not seeking help or through specialist services being seen as remote. Certainly. Boris, I forget the member. I forget, uh, forgive the member for giving way. I thank the member for giving way. Um, perhaps you'll forgive me for that. Uh, can, can I ask the member whether they recognise one of the significant issues that Balmore practice in Postal Park raises for additional pressures is the consequence of UK welfare reform and the additional burdens that places on those GPs? Dr Millen. I'm sure welfare changes do have an impact on, on people in certain areas. I'm not going to go into detail on the, the UK welfare reforms. Um, in, in these areas, there is actually a need for specialist services, I think, to be local and to be readily accessible. There are distinctive problems with the physical and mental health of vulnerable children and families in very deprived areas where the contribution of health visitors is vitally important. Unfortunately, in such areas, the uniform health visiting service, designed to provide support to all families regardless of circumstance, is under serious pressure because of a very high volume of vulnerable people requiring support, coupled with difficulty in recruitment. And this will be compounded next year when the named person rule is introduced throughout Scotland and not just in deprived areas as a result of the Children and Young People Scotland Act. In areas with a high incidence of socio-economic deprivation, it's realised that new approaches and different skills may be required to help people to address social issues and gain more control over their own health and well-being. And to this end, the government-supported government -supported National Links Worker Programme is being delivered in seven deep end practices, including Possible, Possible Park, which hopefully will, will show the way to best meeting the challenges presented by the current health inequalities in Scotland. Patricia Ferguson's motion emphasises that the present funding distribution arrangements take no account of the additional burden placed on staff and resources in the deep end practice. And of course, I accept that, and that resource distribution is a significant factor. However, any potential redistribution across, across Scotland would have to take account of the fact that deprivation is not confined to West Central Scotland, but also exists even in parts of relative, relatively prosperous cities like Aberdeen, and is significant in a number of our, local com our rural communities. Sorry. And of course, demands on health services are increased in communities with a growing elderly population where dementia and comorbidities are an increasing problem. So as I absolutely understand the issues which are concerning Patricia Ferguson, the funding and provision of primary care services is of concern Let's to close, all of us. Please. And I hope the Minister will address these points in his contribution this evening. Thanks very much. I now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank, of course, uh, Patricia Ferguson for bringing this debate forward. It's a good opportunity to remind ourselves that focusing solely on the people in the most deprived areas is only a starting point. I think we also need to look at the resources that are available to them in, in, in their communities. And we all know that GPs are, in most cases, the first point of contact. They deliver 90 per cent of patient care in the NHS but, of course, just receive less than 8% of the NHS budget. But the group of GPs we are talking about tonight is a special group in general practice. General practitioners, literally at the deep end in their deep end work in the 100 most deprived communities in Scotland, who until 2009 had never been convened or consulted by anyone. And, of course, let's not forget other hard-working staff in these practices, such as, such as our nurses. So I welcome uh, this creation of this group by Professor Graham Watt. There are harrowing facts out there about the, the environment the, the group of GPs do have to work in. They provide care for a population with 20% more mental health problems and comorbidities that in the least deprived, uh, sorry, 20% more mental health problems and comorbidities than in the least deprived areas, a gap that has widened since 2008. 
alcohol-related illness and the ramifications of unemployment combine to create an unfolding epidemic, as the Royal College of GPs put it. This is an epidemic uh, which has been which has failed uh, so far, and I don't think there's been enough progress in, in tackling that e epidemic. Yesterday, the long-term monitoring report of health inequalities revealed that between women in the most and least depri deprived areas, there's a 22-and-a-half-year healthy life expectancy gap, and that's 24.3 years uh, for men. The principle on which the NHS was founded, that good health care should be available to all, regardless of wealth, has clearly failed to translate into an effective policy. So their plea for care to be delivered proportionately on the basis of need, as expressed by Professor Graham Watt, is what we should be striving to provide. I regret to note, however, that it is opposite of what is actually happening. A constant reduction in GP funding as a percentage of the total NHS budget since 2007, and this year another £21.7 million left the primary and community care services. Next year, the Keep Well programme will have seen its funding phased out completely, a programme that targets middle-aged men in the most deprived communities in Scotland get a health check to prevent heart disease and diabetes. That's the two biggest killers in Scotland. And last night, uh, of course, the First Minister made a commitment to increase training places for GPs by 100 new positions. Uh, and I welcome that, of course. However, the First Minister made no reference to the already understaffing of G, uh, GP practices in the deep end areas. The fact is that practices serving the most affluent 20 per cent of the population have twice the number of GP trainees than the least affluent 20 per cent. Unless the government commits to changing these facts, it will maintain the imbalance and inequality between communities. So I believe that members tonight have made a point of uh, GPs at the deep end uh, are calling for exactly that the government must allocate the right type and amount of support and resources to practitioners, not based on uh, financial ability, but based on the needs of the population. So the solution for GPs at the deep end aren't e easy, of course, nobody's saying they are, but they are there, and I think we need to enable GPs to achieve them. So thank you. And thank you. And I call on Mark Macdonald to be followed by Margaret McCullough. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I, I thank Patricia Ferguson for taking this uh, debate to the Chamber. I have two uh, practices in my constituency. I'm not sure if they fall within the Deep End 100 or not, but they serve areas of deprivation in the city of Aberdeen, uh, Woodside uh, and Northfield and Maastricht, which uh, both have uh, more than 30 per cent of their patient cohort uh, from the most deprived areas uh, of the city. Um, the, uh, th much has been said about pressures in relation to GP practices uh, widely and in relation to the deep end. And I've experienced this in my own constituency with the announcement by the Bremen Medical Group that they were going to withdraw from the provision of general medical services. Um, the six-month notice period that they had to uh, comply with gave a, a very tight timescale to put in place a solution and, and resolve matters. The new DICE um, medical practice, which has opened up uh, in response to that situation, uh, is now in place and is seeing patients. But I think that uh, one of the things I've written to the Cabinet Secretary about is whether that six-month period needs to be looked at again, particularly in situations where it does arise, to allow health boards uh, and others to have a, a longer period of time to be able to put in place the required solutions uh, to service communities with, general, uh, with a general practice uh, should that need arise in future. One of the things, actually, which is driving some of the decisions by GPs in terms of retirement, and I've had this from a number of GPs in my own constituency, is around pension changes and the fact that it has become uh, more, uh, more beneficial to GPs to take their retirement uh, earlier uh, in order to get a better pension uh, as a result of changes that have been made. So I think that's something that perhaps needs to be looked at as well, but obviously those powers uh, do not sit with this parliament. 
One of the other issues that has been raised is about how we attract more young uh, graduates, uh, more young medical students to view general practice as a career option. And one of the uh, GPs in, in Aberdeen, Chris Proven, who, who leads on general practice for NHS Grampian, is a, is a very good and enthusiastic advocate of the benefits of general practice and the benefits of being a family doctor. And that's something which I think needs to be got out there more. We, we often hear about the pressures facing general practice and nobody would deny that those pressures exist. But we also have to ensure that the message gets out there that there are, are a number of rewards that come from entering general practice because if we don't balance off that message then we don't sell it as an opportunity for young graduates to move into general practice and we don't do enough I think to promote it. One of the other things that I think we need to look at as well is how, how best do we structure health services and the work that the Scottish Government are doing around this I think is something to be welcomed. I also think that there are examples out there and the Minister has been to my constituency, he's visited the Middlefield Healthy House. It is a nurse practitioner led service in Middlefield which is one of the most deprived communities in the city of Aberdeen which is helping in that area to support the work of the general practice uh, at Northfield and Maastricht by seeing patients, by offering uh, advice and support to patients uh, and therefore reducing some of those pressures and also improving the health and well-being within the local community. It's also about how I think we engage organisations from the third sector and Homestart are an organisation who I would readily accept have a, 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 an important role to play and do play an important role. Homestart and Aberdeen uh, are currently working with uh, families to encourage for example uh, home cooking and healthy eating and demonstrating how that can be done and also how it can be done uh, within limited financial uh, abilities that many in deprived communities have. So all of these things working together can support the work of general practice but also reduce some of the burden on general practice because one of the things that we want to ensure is that when an individual sits in front of the GP they are there because it is the GP that is the most appropriate person to see them not because they, they have come to the GP because they feel that is the place they need to go to and working with other organisations with other health professionals I think is the answer to this. There are examples out there and I think we need to look at those examples and ask ourselves firstly can those examples be transplanted into other areas and if the answer is yes why has it not already happened all before now? Good, thanks very much. Now I'll call on Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to congratulate Patricia Ferguson for securing this debate this evening on deep end general practices and healthy life expectancy. In bringing this debate to the Chamber, she has not only allowed us to delve into issues concerning the health service and health inequalities, but she has also allowed us to put on record our appreciation for the hard work and dedication of all those who work in these practices, serving some of the most deprived and excluded communities in Scotland. As the motion makes clear, patients in the area served by these deep end practices will have a lower than average healthy life expectancy. We need to think carefully about how our public services deal with that kind of inequality. How do practices and frontline services cope and how do we as a society ultimately overcome inequalities in health? I want to draw the Chamber's attention to the work of the Socialist Health Association in Scotland and the report into health inequalities commissioned by my party colleagues. The uncomfortable truth documented in that report is that still today a, born, a boy born to a family from Lindsay can expect to live until he's 82 while a, ba a boy born in Calton, just eight miles away, has a life expectancy of six to four. The progress we have made as a nation simply isn't enough when poverty and inequality take so many people from us so soon. The life expectancy gap between the richest and the poorest in our society is a stubborn and stark reality of health inequality in Scotland. It should shame us and it should offend us but it should also motivate us to close the gap. The inequalities in health and wellbeing, which the people who are served by those deep end practices experience, are created and influenced by a number of economic and social factors, insecure employment, family income, housing conditions, a sense of social coherence or lack of it. We cannot tackle health inequalities if we don't reduce the social risk factors which lie behind them. That's as much about education, welfare and housing policy as how our health services are organised and configured. 
The Health and Social Care Alliance are quite right to call for a cross-portfolio response to health inequality. It's a call I would associate myself with today, and Patricia Ferguson is right too. We will struggle to deliver the level of service, the level of service people in communities like Postle Park need and deserve if the burden on general practice keeps on mounting up. I welcome the recent efforts to understand and quantify the additional pressures that deep end practices face. I accept the consensus view that inequalities rooted in multiple deprivation require a multi-layered response. I am personally interested in the National Links Worker Programme, which some of us have received briefings about, and the work on new models of primary care for communities in the greatest need. I would simply echo the sentiment of the motion before us and suggest that we should do more to understand the financial consequences of health inequalities for our public services. Deep end practices are on the front line in the struggle against vicious health inequalities, and we must give them our support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I too would like to congratulate Patricia Ferguson on securing this debate. And I think uh, we can all sign up to supporting GPs in deep end practices and in particular praise the work of Glasgow University in drawing attention to many of the challenges that they face. Um, however, as a representative of a rural constituency, the south of Scotland, uh, I don't wish to take anything away from the very concentrated levels of poverty and associated ill health and mortality dealt with by deep end practices in particular postcodes in urban areas. However, I would be remiss in my duty to my own constituents if I failed to point out that rural poverty is also a serious problem encountered by GPs there too. Um, and often uh, few GPs um, in the Vries and Galloway, um, currently we need to replace 19% of the 132 strong GP workforce in the region. And that's in addition to uh, 12, 12 vacancies that exist at the moment. So I very much welcome the measures that the government is taking to address GP shortages, such as its plans uh, to increase training places by a third, and of course, the eight million increase in funding for primary care. Um, yes, I will. Richard Gibson. The problem is there are 20% vacancies currently. So announcing another 100 isn't really going to be very helpful. It's, it's, it's very welcome, but if there are 20% vacancies already. John McAlpine. Well, I said we're looking to replace, um, going forward, 19%. Um, not, that's not vacancies at the moment. That's going forward. Um, and that's ref referring to Dumfries and Galloway as a whole. But I know that the government, and I'm sure the minister will say more about this, is working very closely uh, with GPs. And as I'm sure you uh, know, you're aware, the challenges in terms of GP recruitment are are very complex. I want to talk today about the motion, specifically in talking about the distribution of, uh, of funds. And uh, while I say I don't want to take anything away from the particular challenges faced by practices in urban areas, I think it's really important to talk about poverty affecting all parts of Scotland. And De Vries and Galloway, for example, wages are lower than the Scottish average. The population is older with the health problems that that associates. And one specific thing I wanted to address today is, is fuel poverty, which sits at 45% of all the homes in Dumfries and Galloway. That compares to 36% in Glasgow and 26% for other urban areas like Renfrewshire. Um, the, the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee this morning heard from witnesses at his fuel poverty session uh, that the index of multiple deprivation uh, which many have referred to today, doesn't really accurately reflect or identify some of the types of poverty that exist in rural areas. For, exist, for example, the committee was told that having access to a car often me means that a household scores lower on the deprivation index. But in the countryside, a car can often be an absolute lifeline, the only way to get to work. And uh, that can result in families 
experiencing more severe poverty because in order to run the car they have to make even more cuts to essentials like, like food and, uh, and heating. And uh, the, the committee this morning heard about the role of the GPs and the NHS in providing indicators that identify deprivation in a, a rural context. And with regards to fuel poverty, which has serious health implications, we also heard that quality advice on the ground from people who are trusted is one of the most effective ways to deliver uh, home insulation programmes and other improvements um, offered by the Scottish Government that can lift families out of poverty. And there's obviously a really important role here for GP practices, and particularly GP practices in rural areas suffering very extreme levels of fuel poverty. Um, and that's obviously something that, um, again, I would emphasise that it's not just urban areas that, that face these very significant challenges. Um, it should be said that while our witnesses um, this morning uh, praised the efforts of the Scottish Government, such as the HEAPS programme, to address the fabric of buildings, a key driver of this kind of poverty and indeed all kinds of inequality are out with the control of the Scottish Government. Uh, several witnesses said that the £350 million pound cuts of tax please. credits already being felt by families in Scotland uh, was uh, plunging more people into fuel poverty. So, in conclusion, providing officer, um, we need to support everyone who is in need, whether they live in urban and rural areas. And we must recognise that GPs in every part of Scotland are dealing with the consequences of inequality, which, of course, are being exacerbated by these welfare reforms over which we have very little control. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm, after which we move to closing speech. Uh, President Officer, I congratulate Patricia Ferguson for bringing forward this very important uh, motion that focuses on health care in the most deprived general practice uh, populations. Now, I think the general problems of general practice that we debated on the 1st of September are highly relevant uh, to this. For example, we know about the recruitment and retention problems. Uh, Richard Simpson has reminded us that training place vacancies is, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, are running at 20%, particularly in the west uh, of Scotland. Uh, and we know that much of that is related to the whole issue of increased uh, workload. Uh, and again, in the debate on the 1st of September, it was described how that was partly related uh, to the shift towards primary care, although not the percentage of resources, unfortunately, towards primary care. Uh, we were all, many of us spoke about uh, demographic change as a key factor and more people with complex medical conditions. But in that debate, and quite often we focus on complex medical conditions in relation to older people, which is important. But what we, what we are reminded of today, of course, that often these uh, conditions affect younger people, particularly in the most deprived communities. And, and that's why a healthy life expectancy is right up there in the title of the motion today, the years of good health. And as Patricia Ferguson reminded us right at the beginning, and men and women in the most deprived fifth of the population, healthy life expectancy ends, in fact, 20.8 years uh, earlier uh, for men and 20.4 years earlier for women than in the least deprived fifth of the population. And that is perhaps the most uh, uh, shocking uh, an important fact to remember from this debate. But of course, it's the consequences of that that has been highlighted by Professor Graham Watt and his colleagues in the Deep End Practices. Uh, and they've highlighted several aspects of this. Obviously, they have more patients with complex comorbidities. There is a whole issue of unmet need in those communities. But one of the key issues he's highlighted is simply lack of time. And he stated, uh, I quote this, since 1948, the NHS has supplied GPs in the same way that bread, butter and eggs were rationed in World War II. Everybody gets the same. In severely deprived areas, this results in a major mismatch of need and resources within, without sufficient time to get to the bottom of patients' problems. Hence the swimming pool analogy in which GPs at the deep end are treading water. The NHS should be seen at its best where it is needed most. And that's really uh, the strong message that comes out from the deep end work. There, the, there must be funding changes in the health service that shift a higher proportion of resources to primary care in general. But within that, health boards have to ensure that the, this, the way they distribute money takes account of deprivation. And that is an absolutely fundamental shift that has to take place if we're serious about dealing with the profound problems of health inequalities in Scotland. Now, of course, 
Doing more in primary care will not solve the problems of health inequalities on its own. We all know about the upstream influences related to life circumstances that are in fact the primary cause of health inequalities. And we also accept that there have to be lifestyle initiatives in order to address the problem. But the role of health services is also absolutely crucial. And that's why getting more resources into practices where the most deprived lived is absolutely essential for dealing with health inequalities. But of course, it's not just GPs, and we have to remember the role of other health professionals, and I'm particularly thinking of nurses here because we had a debate about uh, nursing at the edge where we, where, where we talked about the particular role of nurses dealing uh, with uh, individuals in the most deprived circumstances. So we need to have resources to primary care in these areas that go to the whole primary health care team. And my final word is uh, here is as, as someone who has been a strong supporter of community health projects for a long, long time. I think their work, and I, I always mention the Pilton Community Health Projects and my own constituency in this context, that also should be recognised and valued. But the general message is that deprived communities in general must receive more resources to deal with the profound health inequalities that are manifested in them. Many thanks. I now call the Minister to make the closing speech on behalf of the Government. Minister, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, begin by joining with others in thanking uh, Patricia Ferguson for securing uh, this uh, debate? Uh, I want to make it clear that this Government attaches the highest value uh, to Scotland's GPs and the work they do. Uh, in particular, I think it is appropriate, as Margaret McCulloch uh, invited us to, to do, to place our, our thanks in particular to those GPs working in the deep end practices I have been able to meet representatives of the deep end practices before uh, on more than one occasion uh, President officer and I've been hugely impressed by their commitment to uh, their patients and I think it is well uh, to uh, for us to reflect on the fact that many actively choose or have chosen uh, to work in the communities uh, they serve because that's uh, what they uh, wanted uh, to do they recognize uh, that uh, they are communities that require uh, support this uh, government wants to ensure that local community-based services are uh, delivered by the appropriate range of health and social care professionals working together more effectively. This comes with a commitment to invest in Scotland. We are spending uh, this year £12 billion on our health services, which some uh, £770 million is invested in general practice. Some members, uh, Patricia Ferguson and Richard Simpson, have uh, raised issues around funding for general practice in deprived communities. They're I think it is important to place on the record that there is a recognition of the additional needs of patients in areas of deprivation in the calculation of funding to GPs for the provision of core services. This is shown in the waiting given to reflect deprivation. So the allocation formula does take account of the deprivation. The government will shortly publish statistics showing all funding to GP practices in Scotland for 2014-15. And I would urge members who take an interest in these matters to to take a look at the figures uh, in that uh, regard. We will uh, be investing our uh, recently announced £60 million uh, primary care fund, which was mentioned uh, by Bob Doris, to transform primary care, building on great examples that exist across the country of providing care for patients at or near home rather than in hospital. This uh, fund will also help to address immediately, immediate workload and recruitment issues through a uh, long-term sustainable uh, change. Dr uh, Milne uh, suggests that we would all here except that there are challenges in general practice. There are uh, challenges in general practice. This uh, government knows that GP workload is increasing, as is the complexity of health care. Uh, where more has been delivered outside hospital settings, resources have not uh, always uh, followed. We understand that GP services in some places are stretched, and that at uh, the same time, communities rightly expect more of their health services. So our plan is to transform our approach to primary care to ensure that in future people see the right uh, professionals more quickly. That is why we will continue to work with Scotland's GPs to design that new future. That is why a review of primary care out of our services was commissioned. That is why we need to redesign primary care in a collaborative and uh, inclusive uh, way, transforming and invigorating the workforce, creating new roles and supporting communities to innovate so that services are available where uh, people need them, where people uh, require them. Our challenge is to evolve our health service to best meet the needs of an older population who will often have multiple complex conditions whilst ensuring we drive down health inequalities found in our uh, most deprived uh, communities. Uh, there was uh, some focus, understandably, 
uh, on uh, the situation at the uh, Balmore practice in the north of uh, Glasgow, where both Patricia Ferguson and uh, Bob Doris uh, in particular raised uh, this uh, issue. And it should be uh, acknowledged that Greater Glasgow and, and Clyde Health Board has already begun work to address the issues that have been raised in order to ensure that the practice in Balmore, uh, at Balmore is sustainable over the medium and longer terms. And I will be expecting them to engage closely with GPs and local communities as they begin to develop sustainable, uh, future proofed primary uh, care services. And uh, indeed, uh, Mr Doris mentioned the fact that he had written to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health, uh, Wellbeing and Sport, and in her reply uh, to him that she was clear that uh, she will use every avenue to encourage the Board to work closely with the GPs in the Balmore practice to address the issues they have highlighted and ensure uh, that uh, uh, when he meets with the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Mr Doris will be able to raise the issues that he uh, brought forward in the context of this uh, debate. Uh, overall, uh, health in Scotland is improving and people are living longer, healthier lives, uh, reducing the health gap between people in Scotland's most deprived and affluent communities is, of course, one of our uh, greatest uh, challenges at, at the root of this. And this was alluded to by uh, members taking part in the debate as uh, an issue of income uh, inequality. We, we recognise that this problem, problem cannot be uh, solved with health solutions uh, alone. Uh, as Joan McAlpine and Mark MacDonald uh, mentioned, the UK Government's welfare reform programme presents the most immediate uh, threat to health inequalities in our action uh, to tackle health inequalities. Of course, the uh, Government has responded and will continue to respond to mitigate the worst effects of uh, welfare reform wherever we can. But we also need to look, uh, as I have uh, alluded to, the, the, uh, the further support we can uh, provide to uh, practices at the deep end, as Dr Simpson uh, mentioned. The Scottish Government has provided consistent financial support for uh, the Deep End project via locum funded meetings and uh, conferences and support for other projects in the Deep End, one of which uh, both uh, Dr Simpson and Dr Milne and indeed uh, Margaret McCulloch uh, also mentioned the, the series of uh, Deep End projects uh, uh, leading to the establishment of the, the five-year link workers programme. I understand the desire to see that rolled out further. Of course, it's right that we assess its uh, full efficacy uh, and seek to learn uh, from that programme and uh, members can be assured we will do that and we will uh, continue to support other uh, innovative projects in the deep end practices. We know that we need to uh, continue to innovate and look at the future of uh, primary care. We know that one size uh, does not fit all. That is why we wish to test and seek views on new uh, models of care, including those which might be delivered by uh, multidisciplinary teams in a community hub type arrangement. There are good models out there. I was very delighted to join my uh, friend Mark MacDonald in the uh, visit to Middlefield uh, Healthy House, which was a very uh, impressive arrangement indeed. We need to see professional collaborating across the boundaries of primary and secondary care. And all of this, of course, uh, do I have time? Yes, officer? of course. Briefly, of course. Patricia Ferguson. I, I, mean, I, I think, Minister, we would all recognise that this isn't a problem just for GPs, and it does need the, the kind of multifaceted approach that Mark MacDonald described. But the problem I have is that if you look at Balmore practice, for example, they already have a pharmacist, they've already employed additional nursing staff, they've already got links with the Financial Inclusion Service, they've signed up to a new alcohol initiative, and they now have a drop-in clinic on a Monday to sort of sweep up those people who have not seen GPs over the weekend. But they're still at breaking point, and one and a half sessions per uh, sorry, yes, one and a half sessions per week for eight weeks and a review team isn't really going to get them over the hurdle. They need a bit more help than that. Well, what I have uh, put on record quite clearly is that the, this is a, a priority area for uh, the government in terms of general practice, generally reforming it and making sure it's, it's fit going forward with respect to uh, Balmore practice uh, specifically. Uh, this is something that the Cabinet Secretary uh, is aware of, uh, is uh, a matter uh, ultimately uh, for the Health Board, but we are uh, clear as an administration we expect the Health Board to engage uh, positively with the GPs at Balmore and indeed the wider community to ensure that it has a, a sustainable uh, future. Uh, President Officer, let me uh, come to, to, to close. I, I think it is important that we uh, do what we can to talk up uh, Scotland's uh, general practice to encourage uh, more doctors to stay within the profession. Of course, we had the First Minister's announcement just the other day. And also, we need to try and ensure medical students choose a career in general practice because it's one that deserves to be admired and respected. And that's particularly true in Scotland's most deprived communities. There are a challenge before us in primary care, but members here and the wider public across Scotland can be absolutely assured that this government is determined 
uh, to meet those challenges going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. And I close this meeting of Parliament.